I volunteered. Um, I volunteered working with uh, elementary school children, um, a lot of whom very early on I learned their path in life was not going to be easy. So it was going to be miraculous for them to grow up, uh, be successful, be productive members of society. I quickly learned how lucky I had been despite my own shortcomings growing up in the city of Boston. Um, and then I went on, volunteered at the Roxbury YMCA, where a lot of the young men, uh, primarily young men that we engaged in our program, were young men who were on the verge of getting into the gang life, some of whom had already been involved in dealing drugs. But nevertheless, we tried to engage them, bring them in to the Roxbury YMCA, where they could continue to do their work. That was my initiation into being socially engaged and becoming socially active. Um, so for those who are out there who wonder where uh, one's path started, starts with being socially engaged and active and doing things that at times may make you feel uncomfortable. So from there, I was very much involved in the Black Student Center. We had a lot of conversations about different issues that were going on. And uh, one of my best friends, who still remains a great friend of mine today, we both decided we we're going to go to law school. Um, however, right after law school, I became a social worker for what was then Department of Social Services. As a member of the Department of Social Services, uh, the bulk of my cases were in the Mission Hill projects. If you're familiar, if familiar with the Boston area, at the time, that was probably one of the, um, the more violent um, housing complexes in the city. And there firsthand, I got to see inequities um, based on economic status, uh, parental uh, background. And I realized that, again, once again, some of these young people and some of these adults with whom they lived had not been afforded uh, the ability to, had not grown up in a situation where they were likely to pull themselves up by the bootstraps. So again, this was an eye-opening experience for me. I spent a year there, uh, ended up leaving a little over a year uh, afterwards to go to law school in New York. While there, I continued to be socially engaged, uh, becoming vice president of Black Law Students Association, where we had an outreach program. We continued to do work uh, within that organization. And by my third year, I work in a disabilities law clinic. Um, and during law school, I worked at a number of different agencies. I worked at Libby Mutual, a place where I had previously, uh, during my years in college, worked as a security guard. I worked in the in-house counsel. So really just really getting different perspectives. Um, while I was in law school, I was unclear as to what I was going to do. I did a number of different things in law school. I ultimately ended up coming back to the city of Boston, uh, my home where I had grown up other than um, you know, when I came here at the age of seven from Haiti. So for me, I, I tell you all those stories because it gives you a sense of who I am. Graduated from law school, came back to Boston. I was doing some work. I worked at Department of Youth Services uh, during the time I was working as a probation officer. And again, continued to see uh, the vast differences that exist in people based on where they're born, who their parents are, their educational achievement, financial status, et cetera. So for me, I knew I always wanted to be involved in somehow, some way, making change, being part of the system, if you will. The system that no one knows who is involved in it. It's just the system, the ominous system that no one wants to claim that they take a part in. So that was my journey. And then in 19... 97. Uh, again, my best friend whom I had attended college and law school with, we started talking about policing in the city of Boston. We grew up, I came here at the age of seven, uh, 76. I grew up in Haiti through the 70s, 80s, and uh, finally left Boston in 1993 to go to law school. We started talking about some of our experiences. And we all, both of us had always been socially engaged. And we, we started thinking about how do we really impact there's two ways that you impact an organization. You can do it from outside or you can do it from inside. We both decided that sometimes internal, working from the inside 
to make change was easier than fighting from the outside. We both ended up joining the police department. And I will tell you my first few months as a police officer, I, I had some serious reservations. And some of those were of my own making um, based on my, based on um, how I felt. I know the thing that I had the most difficulty was with was sitting there and listen to the constant uh, descriptions of suspects as young black male, young black male, to the point where if I was in a public place, my radio went off, I would um, walk out or lower the volume because I felt uncomfortable being in those spaces where it's predominantly black people, black and brown people, and hearing these descriptions of suspects, people who look like me, like my friends. Um, so that was my introduction. Um, over the years, I kind of grew into um, accepting that and really trying to figure out what my role would be, um, what my role would be in a police organization, an organization that historically had 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 a negative impact on black and brown people and poor people. So at some point I embraced it fully and I decided that I was going to be the difference. So. Uh, here I am, 20 plus years later, having worked in a number of different capacities. And over the last eight months, I've, I think all officers of color, all police officers, but more especially officers of color, have had to take a hard look at themselves in the mirror and figure out what their role is with this new movement to a social activism uh, to deal with systemic racism uh, especially as it relates to policing and the criminal justice system. Uh, that said, I'm gonna, um, I don't wanna talk too much about myself. I'd like to take some questions if there are any, um, and I can elaborate a little bit more on what my journey is and what my main um, concerns are today in the world that we live in. Okay, thank you, Sergeant Crispin. Um, what I'd like for us to do, I neglected to mention at the start of this program, is to please submit your questions by way of chat to Mia Hazlitt, and she will make sure that they get to Sergeant Crispin. He'll answer a few and then he'll return with his presentation. Thank you. Is there a question or should I continue? The questions are coming in. Okay. Actually, if you'd like, continue for about two or three okay. minutes, Sergeant, okay. and then some more will come in. Thank okay. you. So I'm also as uh, not only a member of the Boston Police Department, president of the Massachusetts Association of Minority Law Enforcement Officers, which I would, I in my mind, I think is the preeminent um, organization dealing with advocacy for people of color. This organization was started in 1968 to force the Boston Police Department to hire more black men and women. Um, and it was all under this uh, idea of hiring minorities. So just to give you a sense of where we were as a city and probably as a country to some extent, after these men and women uh, filed lawsuits, ultimately when one and the city was ordered to hire them under the auspices of minorities, rather than hire these black men and women, they hired a class of all white women uh, to spite them and say, well, look, you asked for minorities, here you are, we're gonna give you minorities. Ultimately, they ended up going back to court and ended up winning what is considered a consent decree which required the department for every a uh, number of white men or women that they hired, they had to hire black police officers. That is the organization, that is the root of the organization. organization. And to this day, we continue to do advocacy work on behalf of black and brown officers. Okay, we have a few questions that have come in. Um, do you think implicit bias training is effective in a policing context? what would make it work or be more effective? I think implicit bias is one of those things that we have to have open, honest conversations about. I think the, uh, the 
the thing is with implicit bias, most of us don't know that it exists. It exists at all different levels. If you grew up in this country, uh, subjected to media and all its forms and watching people, you have implicit biases. And for me, I will give you a brief story that kind of points out how early we develop these implicit biases. So let me just say this. I think implicit bias is absolutely necessary in policing. Um, I think the main issue is how do we allow people a space where they can have open, honest conversations about their biases without them walking away and feeling like, oh man, I just said something that marks me now as a sexist or racist, a homophobe. And can people overlook that because I've been totally honest? I think those are always the hard questions when you ask people to step into a room and be totally honest and transparent. I think unless we have those conversations, unless we create a safe space where even those who clearly have those issues can speak without fair retaliation, I don't know that we'll be able to move past where we are today. I don't think laws are enough to change who people are. I think it takes honest, open conversation between people who oftentimes have very disparate uh, opinions on any number of issues. Okay, and I also have, um, as an officer of color, what was the worst position you had faced in law enforcement? So I tell you, over the last few months, um, it's been particularly hard on me because there were many times and I was standing on the line of the police line with protesters on, on the opposite side of the street or sometimes removed from me by six, six feet. And people feeling like just because I was wearing the uniform, I was the enemy. I think those have been very hard for me because I know who I am. I know the work I've done in the community. I know how involved I've been, how socially engaged I've been in really working on around some of these issues. I think for me, it, it, the last few months have been particularly hard because people have identified me as the enemy just by virtue of the uniform I wear. I think those have been the hardest. I've had plenty of hard moments, but I think given the movement and my alignment with a lot of the principles of the movement uh, that started months ago and continue to this day, I think that has been the hardest that, you know, I'm the enemy just because, and I think oftentimes some of the protesters have directed the anger, frustration, rage at black and brown officers more than the white officers because they felt like you were a sellout to your community because of where you work. Okay, and we'll do one more question and then we'll move on. Um, what was it like to be a police officer during the Michael Stewart case? Um, what did you do to maintain your focus on your goal? I'd love to be able to speak to that. I'm not that old. <laughs> I actually was a college student. Um, I think the Michael Stewart case was in 1992, 91. I think at the time I was a junior in college. Um, and I remember all the stir around this issue. And I think at the time I worked at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and I remember uh, just feeling uneasy um, walking in the area of Mission Hill. Um, and I think in those days, I think the perception of police was that you did not confront a police officer because there were dire circumstances um, that would result if you did. So uh, I think for me, I stayed away from the police as much as possible. And I had a few interactions with the police who generally were not very positive, not because I was involved in doing anything, but just because the whole police culture and the police mindset that, hey, we're the police, no one questions us, we do what we want. So um, that's as much as I can say. I, I know uh, recently, hopefully everybody has had a chance to look at trial four. And I know my organization is in the process of planning a conversation. So it's around the same time period. I know policing has changed drastically uh, since 28 years ago. I know there's still a lot of room for us to improve on who we are, what we do, and how we do what we do. But I think um, I would have been hard pressed to be a police officer at those times. It's easy speaking, saying that from this, uh, from this position now, but um, I think in those days, officers of color did not have much of a voice. They did advocacy, but I think the culture was such that if you spoke out, there were consequences. And I've heard of situations with police officers' cars getting blown up in the station because they challenged the status quo. Okay, so.
So why don't you continue? And I do have, we can come back for some more questions laughter. Okay. Okay. So one of the things um, I've been a, a, a firm supporter of is really getting more people of color into policing, um, more women in policing, more um, English language learners into policing. And people are often asked why. So let me tell you first and foremost why. I think shortly after the civil rights movement, there was a big push to hire more people of color who were from the communities that they police. The idea was that if you were from that community, you would be better able to interact with the community. People would know you. Uh, the interactions would be a lot less hostile. So I've continued to push that. So over the last, probably over the last four or five years, I've really been advocating and pushing for young men and women of color to join policing. And we know over the last few years, there've been quite a few uh, cases that have evolved in both the media, especially on social media, that's where they generally surface. And people have actually looked at those and said, there is no way I want to join an organization that treats people that way, that does stuff like that to people. So for me, the conversation has always been, well, what would you do differently? That's always my first question to these young men and women. Um, what would you do differently? And if you think you would do things differently, that's why we need you in policing. So I am bothered um, because over the last few months, there's been a lot of negative rhetoric um, by politicians and social activists negating the effect of officers of color in policing. And I've told, I specifically tell them, look, if you continue to create this narrative, to speak this rhetoric, we're going to end up in a world where police officers, police departments are going to look like they did 50, 60 years ago. And there is no way that we should be going back. I'm a firm advocate of pulling in people from the communities that they grew up to police their own neighborhoods. Now that has some negative effects, but I think the positive effects are much better than the negative effects. So to the extent that we can do that, I want us to recruit people who are culturally competent, people who are based in the communities. I, I, I know in the city of Boston, we have a one year residency before you take the test. So you could grow up anywhere. Uh, you move to the city of Boston for a year. You are now, um, you can now take the exam and you get called in and you become a police officer. I don't think a year in the city of Boston qualifies you to police in the city of Boston. I think most people who grew up outside the city have this perspective that if Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan, if you will, that those are areas that are filled with crime, drugs, gangs, et cetera. Whereas the vast majority of people in those communities are good, decent, uh, hardworking people who want the best for their families. But unfortunately, sometimes people from the outside come in with the perspective that these communities are crime riddled, um, family is not functional, that everybody there is a criminal. And I'm not saying that's the case with every officer who comes in from outside the city. But I think it's important that we note the importance of having people from the community police their own communities. Um, should I go on or we have more um, I do have, I do have a question. Um, what are your thoughts regarding the movement to defund the police? So I actually wrote an op-ed recently talking about this whole idea of defunding the police. Um, if anybody here has ever had an opportunity to listen to, especially in my district where I work in Roxbury or Dorchester, any of the busier, the busier districts in the city of Boston, you quickly realize the idea of defunding the police is absurd. Um, the police deal with a host of social issues that no one else wants to deal with. Now, if we want to talk about allocating or reallocating some funds to other agencies that can better deal with some of the issues, some of the things that we respond to. The police will respond to a call for shots fired, a person shot, domestic violence, somebody with mental health issues, somebody who's drug addicted, people hanging out, a, a child who's misbehaving. The range and volume of the call is of the calls is astronomical, out of this world. So for me, when you talk about defunding the police, what do we do? What do we do? How do we leave some of these uh, communities, especially those that are uh, riddled with community violence? What do we do with them? Do we just walk away and say, well, the police are defunded? 
So to the extent that we want to allocate uh, funds and put them into places like education, social services, absolutely, I agree with it. Because if we do that, we'll find that we get less police calls. But the idea of defunding the police, um, I think just is ill-advised and irresponsible. Okay. And what training opportunities or programs do you see on the horizon to improve police and community relations? So unfortunately, we don't hear the good stories that police officers do or police departments engage in. And in my position, I'm the uh, supervisor of the community service office. And I will tell you a little bit of what we have in the office. We have a senior service officer whose primary goal is to engage uh, seniors in the community. So she will take them shopping. Uh, we have an exercise program for those seniors. We do a Thanksgiving meal for those seniors. We do art paint, art, art, um, art programs for those seniors. We have, a, uh, we have a youth service officer who continues every day to engage young people. We run a teen police academy. Part of that engages uh, young, young, primarily young men and women of color, engage them in conversation about the importance and value of education, the importance and value of stereotypes associated with their different groups. Um, we have people who travel throughout the community. So I think um, we do a ton of community work. How we change the perspective of policing is that we get more of the people who, and let me step back a little bit. I think generally people talk about their negative experiences. If people have positive experiences, generally it's not very memorable for them. They don't talk about it. And by no means am I saying that there aren't negative interactions with the police. Clearly there are, but I think we need to pull in the vast majority of people who are stopped, who have police officers come to their homes, who have police officers deal with their uh, family members who are emotionally disturbed, uh, suffering from psycho, uh, psychological issues, those for the vast majority of interactions are positive. But I think as police officers, we also need to realize we need to reframe who we are and what our jobs are and how we interact with the community. Okay, and we'll do one more question and then um, you can continue. What age were you when you arrived in Boston from Haiti? What eased your transition to life in the US as a child? And how does that inform your work? So I came here at the age of seven in 1976, probably right in the midst of busing. Um, I did not speak a word of English. I was immediately, immediately transitioned to a bilingual program where there's a classroom full of young Haitian kids who spoke very little English. We had a teacher who was of Haitian descent. That was, that was our framework. Uh, and for me, it was not an easy transition because uh, for those who grew up in those times, if you were different, if you spoke a different language, if you were an immigrant, the transition was not easy. Um, I fought a lot. If there were no bullying laws, uh, yes, I did get bullied, but I have to be honest with you. If you talk to anybody of my schoolmates, they will tell you I was that kid. I fought every school I went to and I, was, I, would, I never accepted the role of a victim. So I fought back. So it was a hard transition. And I think above and beyond that, I came here. Um, I moved in with my father. My, my mother stayed in Haiti. That made it even a uh, harder transition for me because I had grown up very much uh, a mama's boy, if you will. So coming into the United States, um, I transitioned well with the work socially. Other than my Haitian classmates who were in a bilingual classroom, it was a very hard transition because people were not um, as accepting of immigrants uh, to the extent that one is right now. And even now we know there's a lot of negative pushback against people who are from other countries who speak a different language. But back then I think it was exponentially worse. That really framed my perspective of how I saw the world. But as I grew up, I made a lot of friends with uh, African-Americans, if you will. Uh, people who were native here. And I quickly realized a lot of that stuff was just built around ignorance. When people are not, don't know who you are, where you're from, don't understand your background, it makes it easy for them to pick on you, to bully you, to treat you differently, to treat you bad. And you quickly realize once you get to know people, those, um, 
that behavior is based around ignorance and some of it based around false narratives they've been given. You know, these people, they're from Haiti, they smell, uh, they're here to steal your jobs, et cetera. So we continue to fight some of the same battles, but I think um, we're, I think right now I'm in a better place. And I think having understood what it is to travel the path of an immigrant, uh, non-English speaker, um, acclimating to the American culture, I'm much more cognizant of that when I respond to calls, especially for people who don't speak English. Okay, if you just wanna continue, we'll um, save some of the questions. Absolutely, so for me, one of the things that I've been really thinking about is how do we change policing? How do we create a police agency, police department, a police officer that is um, mindful about how he or she polices and, do, and does so in a way that the community wants? So I think for me, if I was in a position, the first thing I would do, I would pull in community activists, uh, community members, not just those people who are very socially active, but also a lot of those people who are daily involved in the work of living going to work, coming home, taking care of their families, cooking dinner, uh, trying to help their kids navigate through this whole new educational system. Those are the people I wanna hear from. I wanna hear what those people want when they think of policing. Uh, one of the things that has happened um, over the last few months, we've heard from the more vocal members of, of our society. Oftentimes they're socially act, social activists, and sometimes politicians, but we're not hearing from the average member of society. So for me, let me give you a perfect example. In my capacity as a community service supervisor, I often attend meetings, at least sometimes in excess of 10 meetings a week at different, different neighborhood associations. And the one thing I constantly hear um, in my district is that people want more police presence, right? And then on the other hand, I hear from some other people who say, look, um, these communities are over-policed. So for me, I wanna know how we balance that as a police agency, because at the end of the day, people want safe, responsible policing. They want the communities to be safe. They wanna be, be able to walk out of their houses and not fear what's sitting outside the house. What's gonna to happen to the children if they send the children out to the park. So to the extent that we can create a conversation that everybody addresses what it is they want from the police and we come to some kind of consensus, I think we'll do a better job. I think oftentimes police officers are pulled in different directions as to what is required of them, what should they do, when should they be a little proactive, and being proactive does not necessarily mean aggressive policing, but how, are you, how do you proactively take on some of these community issues? It ranges from things like there's a group of young men who sit at the corner in front of my house every day drinking or smoking or young women for that matter, right? And as a police officer, if you know that, I know that because I hear those calls and I send, I send notices to the police officers. They proactively see a group of young men or women sitting on those stairs, they approach them. And that approach, the potential exists and not only the potential happens quite often, somebody says, why are you harassing these young men and women? So you get disparate demands from people. And then oftentimes somebody gets to frame the narrative. So for me, I want everybody to be at the table. You tell me what you want the police to do. Do you want the police to, if people are playing loud music, do you not want the police to take that on? You want them to leave it. If that's the case, let the, uh, tell the police, look, we're not, we don't want you addressing issues of loud music. If people don't want, uh, don't mind dirt bikes racing up and down the street doing wheelies, then tell the police, look, that's not something we want you to do. I think police officers oftentimes are caught in the middle of really themselves doing the yeoman's work of all the social problems that exist, but not finding a perfect way of doing it. So to the extent that we can have those conversations, I'd like to have those kind of conversations. Okay. Um, let's see, we have growing up in the 60s and 70s in a large city, I remember we had a police officer living down the street and seemed to know the names of the police officers we saw in the neighborhood. I'm wondering as policing becomes more professionalized, 
as departments have been expected to handle more social issues. Um, see here, they've been taken off the sidewalks and placed in patrol cars. And the federal government has released a surplus of military assets to local police forces. Have we lost our way in terms of community policing and the connection between the officer and the residents of the community? So I will say, I think there's still an effort to do some of that. Um, we still have walking beat officers that are assigned to different sectors of the city in the city of Boston. I don't know how other people do it. Um, I think that's still a part of it. That's still a very big part of it, especially, so this is why I pushed the whole notion of putting people who grew up in those neighborhoods back into those neighbors to police their neighborhoods, right? So I think to the extent that we could do that, we should continue to do that. The other piece of it is if you're that police officer and you are proactively policing your neighborhood, then you get some of that pushback. So you arrest somebody, that person forgets that that had to do with your police position. Your family is there. You have young kids. And I speak personally because I've been approached by people in a mall at a supermarket when I was shopping with my mother. It's really how do we balance all these things so that police officers can safely do their job, but that community members also understand that this is not anything personal that this person is doing. This is his or her job. And that in order for them to keep the community safe, they have to take on these issues. So I think some of the some of that work has to be done at a community level, having people understand this is the job of the police officer, it's not personal. And I think we all have to take ownership of what happens in our community. So yes, we need to put more police officers on the beat who, are, who know people and believe it or not, I think in the city of Boston, for one reason, there's a lot of police officers who are very familiar with people. Unfortunately, the people they become familiar with are the people who are engaged in bad behavior. So to the extent that we can, I'm a firm advocate of putting people on the walk and be getting to know their, uh, their neighbors, who the kids are, where they're from, what they're doing. Some of that still takes place. Unfortunately, it primarily takes place with those people who are behaving badly. Okay, and you've touched on it a bit, but if you could offer a little bit more. From your perspective, if we are oversimplifying this into two sides, police versus protesters, what does each side perceive accurately and what are their misperceptions regarding policing? So from my perspective, I think a lot of people see the police as a uniform. They think the uniform define and dictates who you are as an individual. One of the things I've always said and continue to say that people bring definition to the uniform. The uniform doesn't define you. Right. One of the things about policing is that you can kind of dictate what kind of police officer you are, because a lot of the work that you do is done independently. There's not a supervisor hanging over your shoulder. You can walk out of the academy and you decide, you know what, I'm really interested in, um, in gangs. So you travel, you get to know who the gangs are, and that becomes your specialty. Or you can walk out of the academy and say, you know what, I want to engage with young people. So when you're driving around, you get out the car, you engage and talk to the young people, maybe you play basketball with them. There's a number of different uh, activities that the community service takes on and you volunteer to, to be part of that. Or you can become one of those guys who is particularly interested in drugs and you say, you know what, I wanna be really involved in detecting drugs and arresting people who are selling drugs. So you bring definition to the job. Unfortunately, people kind of think the uniform ends up um, dictating who you are as an individual. No more does no more than this color of your skin dictate who you are as an individual. And I remind people because we grew up in a world that said, you know, the color of your skin does not speak to who your character is. No more than the uniform that you take on and off. So that's why I've been very I've been very vocal about the idea that I'm black before I'm brown because I mean I'm black <laughs> before I'm blue because. I, I go home, I take off my uniform, I have two black sons, I have black friends. When they walk out into the world, it's not like I walk out into the world and I have a big flashing neon sign over my head that says police officer. I face some of the same systemic racist things that every other black man, black woman, brown woman, brown man faces. 
So for me, it's important that people understand that the uniform is not who I am. It's a job that I do. I do it to the best of my ability, conscious of the history of policing and the way that they interact with certain groups of people. So I'm mindful of that. And I think sometimes some police officers, they just see protesters of people who are protesting for no reason, who over, who over simplify different notions about social justice, equity, et cetera. So I think, so for me, over the last few months, I've had the opportunity, I've been lucky, I've had some people from different protest groups I've been able to pull aside and had very positive interactions with. And they say, you know what, I'm happy we talked because I realized there's a lot more that we have in common than you may have with your fellow officer who's standing next to you on the line. So to the extent that people think that police officers are one homogeneous group and we all think alike, we act alike, we see the world through the same set of lenses, that's a problem. And I think police officers sometimes oversimplify things by seeing people just because they're on the other side as being the enemy. Okay, and one more question and then you can move on. Um, what advice would you give to family of police officers who have received anti-police backlash from peers? That's a hard thing. Um, I think it's conversation. It's people understanding and knowing who that individual is, right? So for me, I tell people if, so I used to work in a DYS facility and just give you some, some context for why, why I say what I'm saying. And I would interact with these young men, yes, the facility's all young men. And I would, and you'd get to know them personally. And then at some point you may read their, their, their folder and you'd be like, oh my God, this young man, uh, try to kill somebody. This is not at all the person I know. So I think it's important that we get to know people for who they are as an individual. Uh, the police backlash, unfortunately, there are people who are not willing to stray from what their notions are of police officers as individuals. Uh, the best thing to do is have a conversation. But unfortunately, we live in a world where people who are at different ends of the spectrum oftentimes are not willing to engage in conversation. So for me, I will talk to anybody. I don't care if you're 180 degrees from where I stand. Um, even if we move a degree closer at the end of a conversation, we're closer than where we were. Family members of cops, um, cops as a whole, it's, these are hard times. But I think we have to come to terms of why there's such pushback, the history of policing, the legacy of policing. And, and people have to understand there are police officers who work in that field who also are pushing for change. And that just because the person's wearing their uniform doesn't mean that they're anti-change, they're anti-progress, they're not for social justice, they're not for equity, et cetera. Okay, if you wanna continue and then we have some yes. more questions. Absolutely, so I wanna talk a little bit about this idea of systemic racism. I think over the last few months, we've heard a lot about systemic racism, but more than this notion of systemic racism, we started the conversation with systemic racism and it just focused on policing, right? And I understand why the police, the focus is on policing because police action initiated this whole movement, right? We can all agree on that. So when you start thinking about what is systemic racism? Is it just the police? And I saw a, um, an artist rendition that really put things into perspective for me. So it showed a glacier and the tip of the glacier was, it said police. And at the bottom was this massive piece of ice that occupied a huge space and it said systemic racism. So we can take care of policing that does not negate systemic racism. We really have to do the hard work of engaging and figuring out where systemic racism lies. So for me, I think over the last few months, I see all these major corporations, organizations that have come out, we support black lives. And then my question to them is, how many people of color do you have on your board? How many women do you have on your board? How, uh, how much outreach do you do to urban areas where it's predominantly poor people and people of color? If you're not do doing those things, then you saying you support black lives does not mean anything. So we have to start dealing with these things at its core level. Systemic racism is more than just policing. 
And I have this class I teach during the summer to our teen police academy. It's called Stereotypes and Personal Responsibility, right? At what age do we start having stereotypes about different groups of people? I'd say as early as probably six, seven, or eight, right? We start creating in our mind, we have these ideas planted in our mind as to what it means to be a woman, what it means to be a man, what roles you occupy, you occupy what it means to be Black. So until we are able to get rid of those stereotypes of how people perceive each other at such an early age, that inevitably, you grow up into that person who had those notions that Black people were uh, dangerous. They were primal. They were sexual predators, right? They didn't like to work. The only thing they're good for is to play sports. So until we are able to get rid of those things, um, in our society, we'll continue to see some of the bigger manifestations of stereotypes, racism, sexism, homophobia exhibit itself on a daily basis. We have to address these things. And if we don't, um, we'll make superficial changes that'll look like we've addressed the problem, but we'll be far from addressing the problem. Okay. Um... So I have a question. I'm a female African-American officer and the first in my city. You talked about getting more minorities in these departments, but how would you go about doing that? In my experience with the progress, there is not enough education on the employment progress. In my city, it's almost like if you don't know someone in the department, you don't know where to find the information. So I will tell you, and I think I mentioned this, I'm also the president of the Massachusetts Association of Minority Law Enforcement Officers. Please reach out to us. We've done a lot of outreach with um, different organizations. We've done advocacy. We've spoken to captains, deputies, and superintendents at those departments to try to help them understand why it makes their police department better, the more diverse it is. If you start looking at some of the studies they've done across the country, especially in those departments that have been especially problematic, you'll find that the one thing that's lacking tends to be diversity. So a, a more diverse department makes a better police department. How we um, encourage and push departments to go in that direction um, is through hard conversations, sometimes through litigation, and we're willing to do that. And these times I'd be hard pressed to find a department that says, you know what, I don't wanna, I don't wanna create a more diverse department. They may say that privately, but when confronted with it publicly, you'd be hard pressed to find a department that says, no, I don't want diversity, but reach out to us. I think a lot of it has to do with finding a community. When you are someplace by yourself, you feel alone, you don't feel like you, are, you have anybody behind you who is encouraging you, oftentimes you stay quiet. But once you find out you have this large community of people who are fighting the same battles, you'll find that you walk, your walk is a lot easier um, and that you know, when you need some advocacy, you know people who will come there for you, you'll find that the job is a lot easier. The other yeah. part of it is, is that historically police departments have been white male dominated, right? And those white males encourage their sons, nephews, cousins. So it, it's a legacy type of uh, uh, job. So we have to do a better job of encouraging our young people to join policing and understand that it, especially in today's world, there's a lot of value to your presence in those organizations. So please reach out to us. I'm more than happy to have conversations with you. I will do advocacy for you. And I know in the city of Boston, just recently, I was on the mayor's uh, police reform task force. One of the things I advocated for was a Boston public high school uh, preference. So for young folks who have graduated from a Boston public school, um, they will gain a preference. We're waiting for this legislation to go through the state house and hopefully it goes through because it'll create a whole new generation of young people who will join the police department. The other piece of it is that the Boston public schools are 80 to 85% people of color. So this preference will primarily benefit those young folks. And the other piece of it is that you get paid fairly, paid fairly well as a police officer. And we know there was a study done a few years ago by the Globe talking about the economic, um, the lack of economic, um, well to do of people, black and brown people in the city, whereas I think most white folks were in the $250,000 range, average black family in the city of Boston was probably $8. So to the extent that we can put these kids in a profession where they're gonna make a decent living, 
and they're going to be in their community, serving the community, understanding the perspective of policing, we'll be in a better place. Okay, and one more question. Um, what advice would you give to a police department who is considering establishing a Black Police Officers Association? So I think you always need people who are like-minded. Um, my organization came into being in 1968. When I became a police officer, it was crucially important that I have conversations with people who had been through some of the same things I had been through, people who understood what it was like to walk the streets of a predominantly black and brown neighborhood, knowing that some people looked at you differently because you were black, people who potentially saw you as the enemy or as a sellout because you were black. Those are important conversations. Um, I think any, it, it, I don't think the police department can do it. I think it has to be t undertaken by police officers who are doing the work. I think it's important you find people who are like-minded, who believe in this notion of equity, social justice, fairness, um, community policing. You have to find people who are like-minded. Oftentimes in policing, um, people who come into policing generally have very similar uh, perspectives. So it's important that you find people who are like-minded. And I would also caution anybody who's new to policing, do not create a world around you where all your friends are police officers, where you only go to police officer engagements, where you talk police talk. Make sure that your world is as varied as it was before. Keep your, keep your friends, people who are gonna challenge you on your opinions, uh, who will bring new perspectives to you. I think those things are important. It kind of keeps you engaged it gives you perspective and it'll help you do your job a lot better. Okay, if you wanna continue and then I have some more questions. Okay, so for me, so let's talk again, I wanna go back to this idea of stereotypes and personal responsibilities, right? I, I ask people generally when you think, for me as a black man, I bring these, we usually have a, a team police academy of anywhere from 40 to 60 young men and women, primarily women, men and women of color from the city. And we write a list. What are the stereotypes associated with the different groups of people of color? There are none for young men and young women of color. Other than if you're a young man, they say, oh, you know, you're a good athlete, right? We have to change the, the narrative about what it is to be black or brown in this country. What does it mean? And then I, I challenge people. I challenge these young folks. I said, every opportunity, and it's a heavy burden to bear. I should, I, should, I should preface it by saying it's a heavy burden to bear when you're a person of color to walk through the world feeling like the weight of the whole uh, race, uh, your ethnicity is on your back because everything you do could potentially impact how people see everyone who looks like you. And that's a decision that every person has to decide for themselves. Do I want to take on this challenge? I tell young people, every opportunity you have is an opportunity to change somebody's mind about people who look like you, how they potentially are going to treat your little brother, your little sister, your neighbor, your cousin. Those are things that we have to figure out for ourselves, whether or not those are things worth taking on. I think those are difficult conversations, especially for young people, because you want to walk through the world careless and live your own life. We have to challenge ourselves. Are you reinforcing those stereotypes by the way you travel, uh, by the way you you and uh, you you exist in these spaces, or are you debunking them, right? And those are tough. How do you how do you decide that you're going to take that on, especially as a young person? So for me, I very early on took it on and said, look, this is a, this is a challenge for me. I'm going to change minds about how people look at those who are like me. But again, that's a tough, tough task to ask anybody to take on because unfortunately that's our world that we grew up in. From the time we walk into school, people generally don't say, hey, there's Eddie, he's a young black man. He's smart, he's hardworking. He is well-spoken. You know, Those are not things that people think about us when we exist in those spaces. How do we change that narrative so that when people, the next and uh, the next interaction they have with somebody who looks like me, that they're thinking hard and long about, oh man, 
I know I've always thought that there's this this kid, Eddie, who is a dark skinned black guy, that he's not just an athlete. He has a brain to go along with that. Um, <clears throat> what strategy makes the most immediate impact in helping a neighborhood with violent crime become safer? I'm going to go back. This may make me sound old. I think it all starts at home. Um, it starts at home. I think we have to grow up in, in, a, in, a, um, in a space where we're taught structure, discipline, respect, love for ourselves and those who look like us. When you don't have those things at home and you walk out into the world, it's going to be tough for you to make it. As someone who has seen children as early as third, fourth grade and have to question whether or not this child is going to be able to make it out into the world, it's hard. It's hard. And I think we have to figure out ways to go into some of these homes and provide services to some of these families. Because if that same child who is in the third grade is coming to school, uh, sleep deprived, who's not doing his or her work, who is uh, a discipline problem, that same child in the third grade is going to be that same child who probably by the time they're in sixth or seventh grade is in a special classroom with other children who are misbehaving, right? And that's that same child who's going to drop out in the 10th grade. And then you have to look at what is their life trajectory, right? We've seen, we've, we've seen the pr progression of these children from maybe as early as kindergarten, because I know people who teach and I've been in some of those classrooms, you clearly can see those children who come from those homes that have those, that have those problems. And generally it's not fixed within a year. It's a progression. We have to find ways of really addressing some of the stuff that happens in the home, uh, whether it be placing social services, getting parenting classes, and creating a more functional home, if you will. We all are somewhat dysfunctional, but creating a functional environment so that these children can walk out into the world and feel, feel that they are capable of uh, succeeding and meeting societal standards, if you will, whatever that may be. Right, we'll have one more question, then we'll move on. Um, in terms of implicit bias, what, if anything, did you overcome internally while in the academy or early on as a young officer of color? So I came in the academy, I was a year out of, I was probably three years out of law school. So I'd always worked out and I still work out now. So generally when people see me, the first thing they say, I oh, do looks like he works out. So people have, have their perception, perception of me is that I'm an athlete. Um, and when you come on a job, people don't think about you as someone who is um, an, an, an intellectual powerhouse. I'm not patting myself on the back. Not that, not that I, that's who I am, but I think people don't think about that. You walk out into the world and people see you and base their perception of you based on their stereotypes. And I think stereotypes are something we have to go out into the world and challenge every single day, whether it's on the part of fellow officers or on the part of the community or on the part of you know, uh, politicians. We have to work on those things. I know for me, the thing that was the hardest is really getting past my own issues as it relates to um, what space I occupy as a black man in a police organization that the legacy is negative. And I think even to this day, I fight those battles because as a black person, oftentimes, or a brown person in policing, you're not getting the community backing because people just see you as a police officer. And oftentimes your white counterparts don't see you quite part of the police culture because they think like, can, can Eddie be trusted not to sell information? I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, years ago, I worked in plain clothes um, at a district. And coincidentally enough, it just so happened that there were 
uh, it was a plain clothes car on all shifts. And all the shifts, there were two black guys or two Hispanic, uh, black and Hispanic guy in a K car and there were two white guys. So oddly enough, they were doing this special operation investigation and everybody got invited to be part of the, this investigation except for the black and brown guys. And when I questioned the supervisor and his implicit bias unwittingly came out, he said, look, Eddie, we don't want this information to get out to the community. So I questioned him, I said, so are you telling me because I'm black that you don't trust me that I can do my police work and not go and tell the community that they're investigating somebody who's selling drugs in the community? So some of those are some of the things that we are faced with. I know over the last few months, I've been very vocal about issues of equity, social justice and diversity in the police department. Some of my police officer friends see me as a, an enemy of policing. Some of them have even in secret called me a racist because I'm trying to address these things. So we walk a very fine line when you're black um, or brown in the police organization because you know, you're not necessarily embraced by either side. Your own community doesn't quite embrace you. And there are people who do appreciate it and tell us that they appreciate it. But by and large, uh, they don't see you as quite being part of the community. And our fellow police officers oftentimes don't see us as being part of the police culture. Okay. Um, if you want to continue, and then I'll take some more questions. Yeah. So Part of the work that we did, and, I, and I've been very vocal about this, is this notion of transparency in policing, right? Um, and having people take a hard look at what officers do, why they do it, and how they think they should do it. Uh, I, I've been a big proponent of the idea that we should train community members to understand why police officers do what they do. Um, I think we're at a place now where transparency is inevitably going to become a part of policing. As part of the uh, mayor's task force in Boston, we advocated that they create this new office of uh, police accountability and transparency. We advocated that they create an internal affairs oversight panel. We advocated that they create an office of diversity and, um, and inclusion. All those things are gonna make policing better. But unfortunately, most police officers um, fear change, not unlike a lot of other people. People are fearful of change, especially change that makes them feel uncomfortable. So for me, I'm all about creating transparency in policing. I'm all about making police officers more accountable as long as we do it in a way that's responsible and that doesn't make police officers become the enemy. I think we're in, a, we are in a world now where everybody wants to point the fingers at police officers. And we have to do a better job of framing the argument so that it's about transparency, accountability uh, for police officers and everyone else. Okay, um, question here. How do you talk about Blue Lives Matter versus Black Lives Matter with your colleagues? So, I don't believe in this whole notion of Blue Lives Matter. I think a lot of the people who have gotten behind this Blue Lives Matter, there are people who have gotten behind this, but to me, the Blue Lives Matter is really a slap in the face to people who talk about Black Lives Matter. We know police officers have always been held in high esteem, our lives are valued. And when historically, whenever a police officer has gotten hurt in the line of duty, there's been a cry for justice whereas black lives have often been lost and there's been very little discussion about what that means. So over the last few months, I've seen some of these Blue Lives Matter. I look at the groups. I think these are some of the people from the uh, far right who have a number of issues against black people. Some of them are outright racist, uh, homophobic, and they've gotten behind this uh, idea of Blue Lives Matter. I'm sure there are some good well-intentioned people who appreciate police. But when I see that, to me, there's no comparison between the two, none whatsoever. And I'm speaking from the perspective of a police officer. But I think for me, again, I always say this, I'm black. I take off the uniform. My black life should be valued as much when I'm in plain clothes as it is when I'm in a uniform. And I know, and people can do research on this, historically, when a police officer has lost his or her life, 
there's been a huge outcry in, in the public as to bringing this person to justice who did it, whereas that's not been the case for Black Lives. Okay. Do you think defunding the police will change the way minorities will be treated by law enforcement? Um, I don't think defunding police is the answer. Truth be told, I, I think it, it revolves around training and education. Uh, defunding the police, I think, will have the negative effect of making certain communities suffer. So if we defund the police, what do we do in the interim? It's not we're going to have all programs in place to address some of the issues of crime and violence that exist in certain neighborhoods. And if you look at across the country, generally, there are high levels of crime in poor black and brown and some of the um, socioeconomically deprived communities. So when we say we're going to defund the police, what, what alternatives do we leave those communities with that's immediate and impactful? That doesn't solve the problem, to my mind. And if somebody thinks that it does, and somehow I'd like for them to explain it to me because I just don't see it. Okay. And does the political landscape change your engagement um, and how you interact with others? So I had this conversation earlier. I think we've created a world where, unfortunately, too often the narrative for a story is framed by what somebody posts on social media. And I'll give you a perfect example. We have a police officer who is a traffic enforcement officer. A few weeks ago, he was involved in a traffic stop where the car came up stolen on his computer in the car. He approached this car, he had his hand on his gun, just like how you would do a standard felony car stop. There was a young man who was not at all involved, did not have any interaction with him, did not have a conversation. So he writes this whole social media post talking about this police officer had pulled out his gun, was waving traffic with it, and this post was copied and pasted probably over a hundred times, maybe a thousand times. And people started calling out this officer. Oh yeah, I see him all the time. He's stopping people. It seems like he gets, he, he gets a thrill out of stopping people for traffic stops. I said, he's a traffic enforcement officer. That's what he's supposed to do. And then turns out this police officer never pulled out his gun. He approached the car tactically, ended up finding out that the car had in, uh, mistakenly been placed on a stolen car list. The person in the car was never pulled out, was never handled in any way, sent on his way. But yet and still, this person got to frame the narrative around this story. And after it was all done, there was no retraction. So police officers oftentimes now are hesitant to interact with people and be proactive when they know like, look, I could engage this person and have everything go well and somebody else gets to frame the narrative and I never get a chance to defend myself. So I think police officers are starting to rethink how they take on people, how they engage people and how they do their job. I just don't want us to come into a world where police officers are not doing their job for fear that they are gonna be mistakenly seen as uh, the devil personified. Right. Okay, and we have so many questions here, but I'm going to go on to our last one. Um, as I, I take a look at the time. So, um, as a member of law enforcement, my feeling is defunding the police won't change how minorities are treated until the abusers of these departments are identified and removed. What are your thoughts? I think as people of color and policing, we have to put ourselves in positions where we create policy. We create, we put ourselves in position where we can affect change. It's not enough to be a police officer. And again, there are people who are content with doing that, but I'm also a big proponent of putting yourself in a position where you can impact and affect change that takes place within the police departments, where you can write policy you can dictate policy. So for me, I'm always a big advocate, take exams, get promoted and put yourself in the position where you can do things differently. Um, the narrative is not gonna change unless we get in those positions and we change it. 
It's not enough to hear from outside people who say, look, let's defund the police. We need to be in those spaces where we can create the change that we want to see. So I encourage um, as many people as possible, especially those with a different perspective and different outlook on how policing should be done to join policing, take exams, get promoted, put yourself in positions where you can affect the culture of policing. Um, it's not enough to change the rules, right? You can change the rules, but cultures take a long time to change and you have to be able to be part of that and push those changes along. Um, we can change rules. It doesn't change the culture. If it does, it takes a very long time. So we have to change, start changing the culture and narrative around what it means to police, police responsibly, especially with poor black and brown communities, uh, period. All right, well, thank you very much for that. I'm gonna turn this back to Sarah Ann. Um, and again, thank you, Sergeant Crispin. Thank, thank you, thank you, Sergeant Crispin. Thank you, Mia. Uh, before we bring out Dr. Cox to give us some closing words, yes, a, a real clap. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. Thank you. I'd like for us to remember the words community, serve, protect, and our changing narratives in the 21st century. Just as important, I want us to remember that change does begin with dialogue and intentional, critical conversation, an intentional, critical dialogue, in that we may not enjoy what we hear, but it's the truth. And please recall that I shared the colors of the Pan-African flag and the Cherokee Trail of Tears because we do stand on the land of the Mashpee Wampanoag and they are the protectors of this land. So please remember the emblems that we created for this program. So I'd like to bring out Dr. Cox and have him give some closing remarks. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. Can we all take... Can we all take a moment and just raise our hands in appreciation for what Sergeant Crispin has told us today? And just, you know, I know it's hard to clap when you're on mute, but uh, I, I think it, it says a lot. We, we understand the struggle and we understand the, the opportunity that's before us. And I think having you engaged in our conversation, sharing your thoughts in an open manner really shapes this, the whole notion of what is an intentional critical conversation. It brings new meaning into our interpretation and, and how we can uh, sort of change the needle for our communities going forward. So Sergeant Crispin, thank you again for being here. We're tremendously grateful. And I also wanna make a, say a special thanks to uh, our sign language interpreters, I think that's something new and that's great. We appreciate you being here and uh, making sure the word gets out to everybody. And Sarah Ann, thank you for pulling this all together once again, working your miracles in, uh, in, a, in a tight space on the screen. <laughs> Turned out really well. And, and also a big shout out to the Inclusion, Diversity, Education and Access or our IDEA Committee for their work in creating our intentional critical conversations. As we pause for the end of the semester and the holidays, our conversations will continue beginning on February the 18th in 2021 with a women's panel called Putting It All Together and Making It Work, featuring Suffolk County Probate and Family Court Judge Janine Rivers, and Chief Diversity Officer of Massasoit Community College, Yolanda Dennis, and we'll have three guests from our college as well. Also this spring, we will be joined by Dr. Cedric Woods, member of the Lumbee Tribe of North Carolina, the largest Indian nation in the Eastern United States. Dr. Woods is the founder of the New England Native American Studies Program at UMass Boston. And we will also continue our intentional conversations pathway that will include speakers from the areas of law enforcement, praise and worship, and the arts. The spring series starts in February and it'll end in May of 2021. It'll be moderated by Sarah Ann and more information will be forthcoming as the semester gets underway. So once again, Sergeant Crispin, thank you very much for being with us today and sharing your thinking. And thank you all for being here, participating in our ongoing intentional critical conversations. And we look forward to seeing you again
in the spring semester. Take care. Thank you. Take care and be well, everyone. Thank you.